He is the last surviving member from the band who was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is also a former Marine who ironically worked as an avionics mechanic while in the military and showed his immense bravery when he miraculously walked out of the plane that crashed on that terrible, terrible day of October 20th of 1977, only three days after the Street Survivors album release. Artemis Pyle, former drummer of Leonard Skinner, a total honor to chat with you once again, Artemis. Hey, Kiki. Uh, good, to, good to hear you. Um, yeah, all of that is true. I, and and I, you know, I never consider myself the former drummer because we had that airplane crash. And uh, you know, and and you did mention that I'm the the last guy. And uh, I, I just want to say to that point, it's not a good feeling. Yeah. It's it's a bad feeling. So. You know, I'm not going to change what I do. Um, my band and I have been together 15 years. We have this new album out in honor of Ronnie and the band and the music. So, you know, we're not uh, we're not just resting on our laurels. Uh, we're coming up with new material for a new album. I'm, I'm on my son's albums. Uh, Marshall and Chris, they're both recording original material. So... We're not standing still. Right. And you never have. You never have. You've, you've always been out there. And I do have to say before we go on, though, Artemis, thank you for your service, really. I would have to say also that I watched Street Survivors, the true story of the Leonard Skinner plane crash again. I'm still s- so moved by it. And the sadness, I feel, is nothing compared to what all of you have felt throughout the decades. But... How happy were you once that film was finally released and you were able to get that information out there to us? Well, thank you for that question, Kiki. Uh, I mean, it was cathartic, um, and we worked really hard on the soundtrack and the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Hollywood kind of went overboard on the nudity a little bit, Uh, you you know, but, but that's Hollywood. Uh, but there was nudity, you know, a lot of people streaking the stage right. and, and, and girls flashing us, which I, I have to say, nobody in the band minded uh, that very much. Uh, but, you know, my Marine Corps training did um, help me get to a farmhouse and bring help back to the crash site. And uh, it's been 46 years this last October 20th. It was uh, 40, 46 years and we were actually on stage at the Grand Ole Opry, and um, you know it was it was such a feeling of thinking about all my friends up in rock and roll heaven, you know, thinking, well, you know, uh, we're here, we're representing, we get to play a couple of songs, the place is sold out, you know, uh, Vince Gill, uh, Vince Gill actually dedicated a song to uh, to us. Uh, because it was the 20, you know, the uh, 46th anniversary on the 20th, and we had just come in from San Antonio, Texas, raising money for the veterans, and um, so it, it's it's very, uh, you, you know, um, cathartic to get that that movie out there. Um, my son Marshall wrote a song called uh, "Southern Feelings," and in the in the song it says. Uh, live each day like it could be the last day of your life. Mm-hmm. And it was very poignant because um, in the movie we're getting on the uh, plane for the last time. Um, we crashed that plane. It never landed. Um, and Marshall's song was playing. Uh, it's a beautiful song, and, and it got a lot of airplay. But when you release a movie during pandemic and you release a soundtrack, you know, you kind of get, you kind of get uh, passed over a little bit because the whole world was suffering. So I'm not going to complain about not enough uh, airtime, but we're very proud of the movie, and uh, it felt good to get it done because, against all odds, you know, we we got that movie made, and um, to tell the story because. You know, I, I felt like Leonard Skinner's fans were not getting any younger, and I think they had a, a right to know the truth about what the band went through 
that fateful day and that fateful uh, evening. And um, er everything in the movie is is true. Um, you know, we had to use a different kind of airplane because we couldn't really afford on our budget to get the the same kind of plane. Those those planes are expensive. And so we had to use a, a C-117 tail dragger. Um, I flew in those planes. Uh, we, we called them Goonie Birds. And uh, they had a very safe flying record. So we used um, the the uh, C-117 in the movie. But it's got a good-looking cockpit. Um, it's got it's a twin engine. It's got a good sound. So that's the only thing that wasn't, the, you know, the way... It was because we had a tricycle landing gear um, um, con conveyor, which the tail set up in the air, and uh, one one wheel uh, on the nose. So that was the only difference in the movie that wasn't correct. And you know, a lot of people might say, "Well, this wasn't the same, and that wasn't the same." But we did the best we could. Right. Under the circumstances, being sued by a bunch of blood-sucking weasels out of New York City, and uh, a, you know, a million eight hundred thousand budget, we did the best we we could. So, thank you for bringing it up and allowing me to say that. Absolutely, <laughs> I appreciate and, it. of course. And you know, seriously, as you were talking about it, Artemis, you got, again, again, everyone should watch the movie. Any Leonard Skinner fan, not a Leonard Skinner fan, everyone should watch the movie. Because it's on demand. Um, as you were talking about it, though, it's just so, again, for me, I, I wasn't there, but totally, I can't even imagine the feelings that you've had. But what is or are the main points that you wanted fans, non-fans, everybody who watched the movie to know about what happened that day? What, what do you consider the main point to be? Well, you're, you're right, Kiki. Uh, it, it definitely uh, was an intense film. It wasn't for children. No. Uh, There's, you know, a lot of nudity and, and uh, foul language and drugs and alcohol. So, you know, th this movie wasn't for kids, but... I wanted Leonard Skinner fans to know what we went through. Yeah. Um, you know, the leading up to that and how much the band loved the music and, and how bravely, uh, they, they met, uh, their end. There, there was some yelling and screaming, um, as we went down, but nobody was freaking out going, help me. You know, everybody was basically the, the, the anger that was portrayed in the music. In, in the um, uh, movie, uh, was was more toward the pilot and co-pilot for screwing up. Yeah, the music was you know and, intense, and, and they lost their lives too. So I never hated them, right? But they they made it. They made they, their families lost their their loved one, but they made some really bad mistakes, and and it cost you know Ronnie uh, his life. And he told me in Tokyo, Japan that he would never live to see 30 mm -hmm. and he was 29 yep. and uh he said he would go out in in the in the saddle you know uh for a musician that means uh you know uh, like for a cavalry guy going out with your boots on right that means you're in battle you know and for a musician it meant on the being on the road and ronnie said that to me in tokyo is something you know you just don't forget right and um and it came true. He knew his destiny. Ronnie knew his destiny. And going down in the plane, he went to the back of the plane, and I thought, good idea. Then he came and stopped by me in the aisle. We did the old hippie handshake. Yep. And then he, without any words, he smiled, a beautiful smile, and went back toward the front of the plane. And uh, words not being spoken, he, what he was basically saying is, I know my destiny. Mm. and uh, I'm going to take my place. Oh, and um, and then Ronnie, of course, uh, was killed. Um, and But, you know, there were so many things. He and Steve were going to write so many more songs together because they were such a great team. And Neil Young had presented some songs for, for Ronnie, um, you know, to look at and everything, uh, which, you know, Ronnie loved Neil Young. He didn't hate Neil Young. He loved Neil Young. And they were going to write together, but Ronnie was killed, and that ended that. Um, 
so I wanted the people to know, you know, that that we went through um, some hell, uh, you, you know, and and but R- R- Ronnie accepted his de- uh, uh, legacy, and um, we, you know, a lot of the people that that lived through the crash, they're all gone. Yeah. I'm the only one left. Mm. As, as far as uh, in the band is concerned, right now, one of our backup singers, Leslie Hawkins, uh, is still you know with us, and she lives in Florida, um, but she has you know medical issues. I've I've asked her to come out and jam with us many times mm-hmm. um, uh, because she's just so good. And Ronnie handpicked the girls. You know, he wanted somebody from like Broadway. Which was, you know, which was Kathy Gaines with that big Broadway show voice. Yeah. He wanted somebody with the whiskey breath, you know, like a, and that was JoJo. She had that, that raspy voice and he wanted a, a, a contralto, you know, which was, uh, Leslie Hawkins. She was, she was his, uh, a soprano. And, uh, he knew in his mind that that would work. And it did because they had a very unique blend. And, um, so, you know, losing Gary Rossington was, was a, a real blow. Um, but he was 71. I went to his service with my band. Uh, it was very respectful. Um, they, you know, there was rock stars from all over the world. Uh, uh, Simon Kirk and, and Paul Rogers from Bad Company. Yep. Uh, they spoke words about Gary. And uh, talked about what a gentle person he was. Uh, all of his guitars. I'm sorry, Artemis. Were all over the chapel. Yeah. Um, you know, with with pictures of his grandchildren, and all of his famous guitars were um, displayed, and that was something to see. And pictures of Gary and his family. Uh, it was beautiful, and. Um, Travis Tritt uh, sang a song. They were friends. I think their their uh, their homes were close to each other out uh, north of Atlanta. Uh, Gary had a, a really nice mansion, you know, there, and I'm sure Travis had a nice place. So Travis came down and sang a song for Gary, and um, it was um, it was dignified. And uh, so you, you know, losing Gary. Um, Judy Van Zant called me, um, you know, over the years, Judy and the band had been at odds, mm-hmm. but I really appreciated Ju- Judy calling me. She said, Artemis, I wanted you to know before it hit the, hit the TV and the airwaves. I wanted you to, I wanted you to hear it from me. And, um, and I, I told her, I, I said, I, I really appreciate that Judy. Thank you so much. And a uh, very short conversation. She said, do you want me to let you know about the, the arrangements? And I said, absolutely. Um, and, 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 and so I just said, thank you. Yeah. So, um, and then I saw her at the funeral and she was very cor- cordial. I saw Gary's widow, uh, Dale, and Gary's uh, daughters, Annie, Kathleen, and Mary Elizabeth. And I took each of them a white, clean handkerchief. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought that was important. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the the day, uh, they were still clutching those handkerchiefs instead of a little balled up piece of tissue paper. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I thought they deserved to have because I knew they were going to need it because I knew it was going to be emotional. Yeah. And it was emotional for everybody. And um, losing Gary, uh, but I'm going to continue with my band. We have this new album. It's amazing. Anthems. It is a, a tribute to Ronnie Van Zant, his music and, uh, his band. And we've got Dolly Parton singing Freebird and, you know, um, good old, uh, Sammy Hagar singing Simple Man and Warren Haynes on Saturday Night Special. Um, we had people, we have an, an, an impressive list of rock and country paying tribute to Ronnie and putting their best foot forward because they're singing for Ronnie. And, you know, when Dolly played me Freebird, I cried like a baby. Mm. And, um, and it was, it, it's so beautiful the way she did it. And we had this 
incredible arrangement that we came up with for her. The producer on our album, it's called Anthems. You know, uh, Ronnie Van Zant wrote songs that'll be here a thousand years from now. Right. And they weren't just hit, you know, right? And, and they weren't just hit singles or hit albums. They were anthems. Right. And um, so we're very proud of what we did on this album, working with Dolly's producer, getting a great sound using modern technology and modern recording techniques, you know, and get, putting a little polish on all of these songs. Of course, there'll never be anything better than the original. Right. There'll never be anything better than the original band. Absolutely. There'll never be a recording better than the original recordings, you know. But we, we wanted to put a little shine on them using modern stuff and all these incredible vocalists that wanted to come in and honor Ronnie. And so I'm glad we did it. It's, it, it is a tribute album. I think one of the best ever made. And, um, so, uh, that being said, you know, we do have 1500 vinyl, uh, that are available, 500 available on the Artemis pile band.com website. They've given us 500. Um, and then a thousand are going to go into the box stores, but Kiki, that's what everybody calls you, right, Kiki? Yes, yes. Well, Kiki, um, the the thing is that the money that is made from this album is not going to go in my pocket. It's not. We're, we didn't do this for money. Uh, the money, all these songs were written by members of Leonard Skinner, Ronnie and Gary and Alan and, and and Billy and and Leon and and these their families, their children and their grandchildren will reap the benefits of the sales of this album. And, and so I want to be very clear about that. We didn't, you know, like on the movie, I, I didn't make a dollar on that movie. Yeah. I gave all of that away, including the soundtrack. Um, all of that was, was basically free of charge. Uh, the writers of the songs get something because it was all original soundtrack. Um, except for Call Me the Breeze, which we used in the movie, and we were able to use it because it's a J.J. Kale song. You know, we didn't have to worry about the licensing for Skinner because we just paid the licensing fees like anybody else does yep. and used it in the movie. Um, so I haven't been doing these projects to make a big bunch of money. You know, I drive an old van. I don't have a new car. I don't, you know... I don't live a, an extravagant lifestyle. I, I I have a very humble abode that I live on 50 acres and a farm in North Carolina. Wow. And um, That's a lot know, of land. We, we are surrounded by animals and uh, horses and cattle and pigs and donkeys and, <laughs> and goats. And, and I love it. I love every second of it. That's awesome. Um, it, you know, I'm not about the money, Kiki. I'm about the music. And like I say, this new album, Anthems, it will go to, for my friends up in rock and roll heaven, it'll go to their children and their grandchildren. And um, I, I'm paying it forward. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And you know, it, as you're saying this about Anthems, because I was, of course, going to bring that up, um, it's just incredible to me that at this stage of your life, like you're saying, and many of the artists I've spoken to, you guys do this because you love it, because of your love for the music. I, I mean, a lot of you, by the time our conversation is over, it's always, you know what, I would do this for free if I could. I, I, I just need to be around the music. And connecting that back to Gary Rosington, the late Gary Rosington, he basically really went out on stage, I mean, the guy was taking heart attacks on stage. God bless him, and he he just he continued. Seven. He had seven seven heart attacks. He kept playing and playing and playing, and he always went out there because this is what he loved to do. Now, did you guys ever mend your fences? Yes, absolutely, and and it was because of the song "Freebird" on our new album anthems. Really, because we had Dolly Parton. You know, I'll tell you a real quick story. I, you know, got in touch with Gary, uh, said, hey, would you like to play on our new album? We're going to do Freebird, you know, and we're going to do a bunch of the songs. And we've got, 
you know, guest uh, vocalist. And Gary came back very honestly and said, you know, I'm not in great health. I don't feel that good. But if I get to feeling better, I would be honored, you know, to play on the record. Wow. Well, I went right back to him. Uh, and, oh, by the way, Gary, Dolly Parton is singing Freebird. <laughs> and Gary immediately came back and said, you know what? I feel a lot better all of a sudden. <laughs> and uh, so I got Gary Rossington through hell and high water. Uh, I mean, it was not easy. Um, I got Gary Rossington hooked up with Dolly Parton's producer, uh, Kent Wells. And we got Gary's iconic slide solo mm. on the song Freebird with Dolly singing the vocals. Wow. So I got Go Dolly and Gary together. And um, Dolly and Gary together uh, is Golly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> right. <laughs> and Golly, what, what a song. And, you know, and also on Dolly's version, it's on her album. She right. asked me if she could put it on her album. And I said, of course, because she was going to do a rock album because I said I was going to vote for her because, you know, I, I get to vote every year in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since I was inducted because of Ronnie wow. in 2006. Yeah. So Dolly said, well, I don't know if I'm going to accept. I said, you know, why? And she said, I don't think I deserve it. And I said, Dolly, you deserve everything. Wow. And, and so she said, well, can I put it on my rock album if I do a rock album? So she did 30 songs, I know, and, I know. and we're on there, and on her version of it, Judy Van Zant okayed uh, for D Ronnie Van Zant to be drop his vocal from Freebird to be dropped in on the second verse. So it's Gary, Dolly, and Ronnie singing together on this version of Freebird on Dolly's album. Now, on our album, it's only Gary and Dolly. And I say only, uh, whoa, right. but no, it's Gary and Dolly, but we wanted to do something different for our album and something different for Dolly's album on Freebird. Yeah. So she, of course, had the pull and Judy Van Zant really warmed up to the idea and they worked together and we got that done. That's so, so good. You know. That's so good. I'm glad that worked out like that because I know there's been a lot of yeah. tension and a lot of, you know, you've had a lot of hurdles to jump through as well with regards to the movie and, and all kinds of other things. So I'm, I'm really glad that that happened and that was able to come together. I've, I've been falsely accused. I, I've been drugged through the system. Uh, I've been fleeced, you know, by, by the state of Florida. But, but the truth is I do love the music. And there was, when I went to Gary's funeral, um, you know, with Judy calling me and letting me know and seeing her down there, she loves my band. She loves the guys, yeah. Jerry and Scott. We went down and uh, she, she really, um, you know, I think there was a lot of healing, Kiki, uh, that, that happened at Gary's funeral, uh, that his services. And there was a lot of healing that went even further for this um, this cut of Freebird on Dolly's album with Judy signing off with Ronnie singing with Dolly and Gary playing slide. Um, That's there's, great. There's, and then the text back and forth between Gary and I to get this project done, I cherish. I, I still have them in my phone. Yeah. I will never let them go. And it's, it's just Gary saying, hey, Artemis, I love you, man. I love your family. Let's get together soon. I know our paths will cross. I love the uh, Dolly singing Freebird. Mm -hmm. Everybody would love it. The whole band would love it. I know Ronnie would love it. I have these texts on my phone mm -hmm. from Gary to me and me respectfully going back and saying, hey, Gary, you deserve this. You deserve this. And and I, I, I cherish those texts. And you're... You're so right. There has been healing. There has been, um, you know, uh, th that feeling between Gary and I, mm -hmm. and now he's gone, and um, and and with Judy. So you're you're 100 percent right. Thank you. Of, Thanks for bringing it up. Of course, of course. And and how Artemis? How did you and Gary get to that good place again? When was it? And who reached out first? And how did you get there? 
it was it was the song Freebird with so, Dolly. So is that is that yeah. what really brought you to? So up until that point, you guys hadn't spoken at all. No, his management company kept Gary and I apart for years okay. because there was more money for them to steal that way. Okay, gotcha. if Gary and I had come together, so they 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 did everything they could do to diminish my role in Skinner and and keep Gary and I apart. And but they weren't able to due to the power of the wonderful humanitarian Dolly Parton and this album that we did anthems. Uh, and and Dolly's producer Kent Wells, he was the key because he has uh, credentials. So Gary knew that I wasn't trying to do some fly by night bullshit. Yeah, you know Gary knew that this was real. Right, and uh, that's that's what brought us together. And those texts just before Gary's death, back and forth between us, him saying, "Let's get together." You know, and, and I love your family because he did. He loved my sons, Chris and Marshall. He knew them. You know, uh, he he knew my wife Patricia, who's in the movie. You know, portrayed in the movie uh, as the wonderful, sweet person that she is. I mean, Gary knew these people, and we had been you know alienated for years because of money and greed and management and lawyers and assholes and butt kissers. I'm just being honest. No, I, I want you to so, be. I want you to be honest. It, it, you know, Gary Gary and I came back together due to the power of Freebird and Ronnie and and uh and Dolly. So there, there there there's nothing else that brought us back together other than the power of the music. Now did so you thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> now did you tell Dolly that story? Did you tell her that she was the reason that you and Gary got back together? I haven't spoken to Dolly since she recorded. I last time I saw her was in the studio that day. She played the vocal for me, and we've done several uh, shows to raise money for breast ca- cancer awareness. Mm-hmm. That's so uh, nice. in Nashville at Ryman and you know in other places. Uh, but I haven't spoken to her, and um, I look forward uh, to speaking to her. Uh, about this in the future i'm sure we'll see her again i'm sure i'll be with her and and i will tell her um you know i don't have her phone number it's i mean she played on her album and we do stuff to raise money for breast cancer awareness but you know uh we're 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 not like best friends or anything I, i love her with all my heart right and everything but she is so busy she has so many things to do you know i am not a priority but someday, I feel that we will be uh, in, in uh, each other's presence, and I will tell her how much that meant to me uh, for Gary and I to come together uh, with that song and her vocal. Because I, I cried like a baby when she played it for me in the, in the studio in Nashville, and that's before Gary, that's before we even lost Gary. Wow. And she knew that it was emotional for me. Yeah. Well, so yeah. she knows. She, she knows. And, and Kent Wells... Uh, I told him, you know, uh, how much it meant. He told her. He sees her every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she knows. She knows, although I haven't personally been able to tell her. She she knows. That's that's amazing. And it, it really makes me feel good that, you know, again, here we go with the power of music. The power of music, I believe, kept Gary alive for as long as he was because he kept going out on that stage no matter what. The power of music brought you and Gary together, which is so amazingly huge i mean the fact that you it, it is you told us that thank you so much for sharing that because i i know there was there was contention between the both of you you know from going back to the blood oath and you know the the, the well rules. it wasn't between us <clears throat> it wasn't between us it was between the management people and the lawyers and all the all of them that kept this stuff all stirred up yeah gary gary and i were fine that's a shame. You know, uh, but but we but they kept us apart. So they they did have the power to keep us apart and keep me down and try to keep me out of the the situation. Um, you know, the the rule of three and the blood oath and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, but but that blood oath w- was uh, a sham. That they're, they're they're you know Gary and Allen signed a piece of paper and that was filled in after the fact. That was that was a 
uh, th- that was a, a, a crooked uh, thing. Gary knew that. I knew that. Uh, but, uh, you know, to the rest of the world, uh, the, of the Skinner world, it, they, they tried to portray it as, you know, uh, the, the, Gary and I were, have, were always fine. We, lo- we you know, we, we were brothers, and I, I love Gary, and I know he loved me and my family. Uh, but no, it was, it was greed and money and power struggles and all of that stuff that kept that stuff going. So, you know, uh, Gary and I were fine. And that's, that's why the last text he sent me was, man, I love you. I love your family. I can't wait to see you. I'm sure our paths will cross. You know, the song is amazing. I love what you did. Thank you for doing it. You know, Dolly's amazing. So it was all, it was all positive. It's, it's the, those management companies. That, that try to isolate their 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 uh, cash cow. Do you understand? Yeah, it, it, that's that's just so sad. It's so sad, Artemis. I mean, because y- you all were together for a reunion tour. What ten years after the crash had happened? So, well, you- I was living in Jerusalem, Israel, and and Gary called me and said, "Man, we have a chance to make a lot of money for your all of your causes and your people and your family. You know, let's get together and and." Their sold out shows. Let's do the tribute tour. You know, my sons were on the show with me. Uh, you, you know, on the, on the tour, uh, we had eight tour buses running up and down the road and a bunch of trucks. And yeah, yeah, no, it was beautiful. Uh, but drugs and alcohol crept back into the scene. Mm-hmm. But Kiki, this is what I want to do. I, I have to go to rehearsal and I have to drive about 40 minutes to get there. Uh, and it's, it's raining like hell here. Okay. Um, I got to go, and let's talk again soon. And we got snow on the top of the mountain, um, up at Grandfather Mountain and everything, about 6,000 feet up there. Um, They, they of course, Boone, North Carolina, where my son is at Appalachian State University. They they got snow, but we're down here uh, on the foothills. You know, we, we look at the mountains, but we're in kind of the foothills, and um, we we did not uh, get a, a a snowfall uh, as of yet. Very well, that's good. But it sounds like you have a pretty beautiful view. We do, we do. Uh, it's it's a great place to live. And you have a farm too, right? Well, I you know I'm on uh, 50 acres, and this place used to be a you know functioning uh, farm, um, but. Now I'm on 50 acres and it's a functioning rock and roll farm. Um, so uh, we we grow rock and roll here. <laughs> and but again. I'm surrounded by donkeys and horses and cows and uh, chickens and pigs and goats. Um, the, there's little farms uh, out here in the country around us. So when all of my uh, my granddaughters come to visit me, um, we just walked down the road about two minutes and we're on like a little mini, almost like a petting zoo, but it's, you know, it, it's my, my neighbor's farm, but they have lots of nice little animals and um, my granddaughters love it. So you get all the fun without all the work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> farm, farmers are uh, the hardest working people in the in the world, so... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And your rock and roll farm is definitely producing so much cool stuff. We're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But, you know, just wanted to take you back a little bit. Um, after the crash happened, you guys did a reunion tour. You, ha- you had a, a, gr- a great thing. Go. You, 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 Gary, Ed, Leon and Ronnie's younger brother, Johnny. Now, you did the reunion tour was there talk about performing at the crash site and, and what was your thought on all of that? Well, I, I mean, um, the, you're, you're talking about when we went down to Mississippi, right? 10 years after the crash happened, you guys broke, you know, you broke apart and then you got back together for the reunion tour. So what happened to that? The reunion tour was all over America and it was sold out you know, every single show, um, we, we did not play at the crash site with that band. Um, we, uh, later there was the 25th remembrance of the plane crash. And I took my band at that time 
to Mississippi and played in Macomb, uh, close to the crash site. A- actually, you know, w- within a, a, sto- a double stone's throw from the crash site, uh, Travis Tritt was on that uh, bill and a whole bunch of bands. But um, the local uh, sheriff's office was paid off to uh, do as much damage to keep the show from going as possible. Uh, the uh, the liquor, the, you know, the beer license was taken. Uh, the merchandising license was taken. The food license was taken. And, um, you know, they the local authorities were paid off uh, out of Jacksonville, Florida, to try to destroy what we went down there to do. I didn't go down there to sell T-shirts. I went down there to honor my friends. Right. Why would they but, do uh, that? Why? Why? Why was what? Why would they do that? Why would they try to stop the show? Greed. Uh, greed and stupidity. Um, so um, we did it. But the tribute tour was a whole different thing. I came back from Jerusalem, Israel, uh, where I was living. And uh, I lived in the castle of King David on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, my son Marshall and Chris were over there. My family, my uh, wife Patricia, and uh, they they came over, and we were all just kind of studying, trying to become better human beings, and uh, you know, uh, and and uh, educate ourselves and become become uh, I would say enlightened. Uh, but the the tribute tour what I came back to America for was with Gary and Leon and Billy. Alan Collins was uh, with us, but he was in a wheelchair and the management company said they thought it would look bad for him to be on stage in a wheelchair. I totally disagreed with them. And I said, Hey, it's Alan Collins. You know, what, what do you mean? Looking bad. There's a lot of people that are in wheelchairs. Right. And, uh, but management companies and lawyers, all they care about is money and who they can screw. And, uh, and we, were, we were about the music. I'm still about the music. Yes. That's why we did this new album that we did. Right. Um, you know, anthems. But, but back then, during uh, the, tr- the tribute tour, we called it, uh, it was with uh, Ronnie's younger brother, but uh, I, I promise you, Ronnie Van Zant had all the talent in that family. Yeah, yeah. You know, Artemis, what made you decide to move to Jerusalem? Um, to work on my character and to educate myself further and uh, try to become a better human being. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. How did that change you? Because you, you seem like you were a great human being to begin with. So how did that... Did that give you peace? Of course, yeah. Uh, I, I lived in the castle of King David, um, you know, where Christ uh, walked those uh, hallowed halls and, you know, uh, on the Via Della Rosa uh, that led uh, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre through the city. And it started at King David's castle. And um, it's it was amazing. Uh my son Marshall and my son Chris both started writing serious music and serious words about the state of the planet, and um, so you know it was it was a a very educational situation. Uh, I was acting as a kind of a bodyguard to a lot of the rabbis um, at, at the diaspora yeshiva there on Mount Zion. And the school. Uh, I'm I'm a Gentile. I was raised in the Methodist Church, but uh, I and my family felt like it was a good thing to help the Jewish people, and uh, so I acted as a with my Marine Corps training and my weapons training and everything. Uh, I I was uh, uh, a bodyguard, kind of undercover, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the children and the the rabbis and the 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 families um and it's it's something that uh that made me feel uh good inside it 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 made me feel like i was doing something important 
I mean, that's something I didn't know about you. So thank you for sharing that. And and why did you why did you decide to come back to the States? I got a call from Gary Rossington and Alan Collins one night, uh, a transatlantic uh, phone call. Uh, there was a storm at sea and the uh, transatlantic cable. There, there was a lot of static um, because of everything that was going on in the weather across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but I was able to hear that uh, Gary and Alan say, we're going to put a tribute tour together. It's 10 years after the plane crash. Uh, all of the cities, you know, are sold out. Uh, we have eight tour buses lined up. We've got all uh, the tickets have been sold. Um, everything is, is sold out. So, you know, we, that was impetus for me to get on a plane, come back, rehearse with the band, um, work up our set and go out and play to, um, you know, sold out shows all over America. Um, my son Marshall and my son Chris were on that tour with me. Um, acting as, you know, moral support for me. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's what happened. That's awesome. You were able to have your sons with you. I mean, who, you know, a lot of people can say that now, but back then, you know, that a while ago, you were able to take your sons with you and just have that extra, you know, bit of family alongside of you to get you through. I, I needed to share what we were doing um, selling out every place that we played across, you know, the, the, the planet here. I needed them to be with me. Um, it's something I wanted to share with my family. And um, it, it was a distraction for all of us. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, everywhere we played was sold out. What did your sons say? You know, when they when they actually witnessed that with you, not that it was back in the day, but they still got to witness sold out arenas with you. What I, I mean, were they just blown away all the time, or did, what was their reaction? Well, I can I can say, yeah, Chris and Marshall were blown away, uh, but actually, when they lived in Jerusalem in the castle of King David, a three thousand year old crusader castle built by the Turks and the Romans and, and King David, um, it, it caused them to start writing music. And my son Marshall is an amazing songwriter. Um, he wrote music for our movie about the plane crash. My son Chris is an amazing songwriter. He wrote music for the movie. I'm the drummer in Chris's band, um, Pile Tribe. And uh, I jam in Marshall's band, uh, Throzwobble, um, that uh, that he puts together, and I and I jam on percussion sometimes uh, with them. And um, so, you know, you, you ask me what it meant to them. Uh, it it was the impetus uh, impetus for them to begin songwriting, and both of them are amazing. Um, Marshall writes beautiful music. He's got an incredible voice and he's a player. And, uh, I live with him on this 50 acre farm here in, uh, Morganton, North Carolina. Um, I'm only an hour away from my youngest son, River, that's graduated from Appalachian State University last year. Uh, he got his degree in sustainable environment. Wow. Congratulations and, um, to him. So, we write music, we play music, and uh, and we're really good. It's tribal. <laughs> keeping the family together, keeping the music and the family together, which is, you know, really what it's all about. It is. It is. Artemis, who's the most memorable band you ever, ever played with? Putting your son, and not that I want to put your sons aside, because we know that you love them very much, and you guys have just a great bond together, but back in the day, who was the most memorable band? Leonard Skinner, while you were there, ever played with uh, okay I'm the the most memorable band memorable band that I ever played with was Leonard Skinner okay <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you're are you talking about uh, who was on the bill yeah. that I remember yes with us yes. well it's got to be Nebworth um, the Rolling Stones 10 CC hot tuna Todd Rundgren uh, the Don Harrison band, which is uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, 
uh, without um, John Fogarty. Um, that that day, that show outside of London, three hundred thousand people. Oh wow! Uh, there's been different estimates of how many people were there, mm-hmm. but with everybody that was there, and uh, it, it was a it was more it was closer to uh, three hundred thousand, and um, so it was the Rolling Stones, and 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 you know we hung out with Jack Nicholson, Paul McCartney. That day, and Linda, Linda Eastman McCartney. Wow. Um, I, I was privileged to be able to meet uh, the beautiful Linda wow. uh, before her passing. And, uh, and of course, hanging out with Paul McCartney and uh, people like Jack Nicholson and um, that were there to see the Stones. They were all smoking a bunch of weed and uh, having a great time. <laughs> and um, so that one stands out. But, you know, we played with all of the great bands. I mean... Everybody, you sure did. Uh, so, you know that's uh, it's it's all uh, very memorable. Um, the bands that we played with, and uh, it, it's like people ask me, "What's your favorite drummer?" Um, it, you know, if I had to choose one, and I can't say that enough, I'll say it one more time: If I could only choose one drummer, and I've got hundreds of favorite drummers. I'm a jazz guy, you know, Omar Hakim, uh, you know, all, all the great drummers. Um, but if I had to choose one, it would be Neil Peart. Wow. Uh, because Neil was the dr- a drummer's drummer. He, he wrote a lot of that stuff uh, for uh, the band, um, you know, Rush. Yeah. Um, and he, nobody had a set of drums like him. Nobody played like him. Uh, he was an amazing person and uh, went through a lot. Uh, lost his family and everything. And I have to say that Neil would have to be number one um, of all the drummers that I love. Ginger Baker, you know, uh, the, the great Ginger Baker and, and all of the great drummers that are out there. Um, John Bonham and, 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 and I, I got to meet... Uh, uh, you know, Keith Moon from The Who. But Neil Peart, I never got to meet Neil. And we did play with Rush a couple times at stadiums. But uh, I never got to talk to Neil. But he would be my favorite. It's just like if somebody said you could only choose one guitar player. Well, I've, I've played with the greatest guitar players in the world. Uh, I've jammed with Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, not to mention the four guitar players of Leonard Skinner, Gary Rossington, Alan Collins, Ed King, and Steve Gaines. Uh, they're right up there on top notch. But if I had to choose one, it would be Jeff Beck. So, you know, and if, if I had to choose one gig, like you asked me about what stands out, well, it has to be when we opened up for the Stones mm. and we hung out with uh, people like Jack Nicholson and Paul McCartney. I mean, you just don't forget that, you know. Absolutely not. How could you? I mean, that has to be at the forefront of your brain, you know? It is. So now, Artemis, there are tons of conspiracy theories out there about who said what and what's true and what's not true. What do you say to those? What do you say to those people? Because, like, to me, you were there. Like, you know what happened. What do you say to, to the conspiracy theorists? Are you talking about the plane crash? Yes. Uh, and like, you know, when you went to uh, Johnny Moat's house, farmer Johnny Moat, and, you know, you said you were shot. He said he didn't shoot you, you know, just different, different things. There, there's all kinds of videos out there about what's true, what's not true. But I mean, I'm going to take it from you and you're the source. You were there. What do you say to the well, conspiracy theorists? OK, well, I, I'm a pilot. I, I don't have a current ticket, but. I, I was a pilot. I've flown jets. I've flown multi-engine aircraft. I flew the plane that we crashed. I flew the one that we had before we crashed that one um, that belonged to Jerry Lee Lewis. I've never been knocked unconscious. I've had three airplane crashes. I lost all my friends in a plane crash. I lost my father in a plane crash in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so, I, it, as I say, I've never been knocked unconscious. Um I know what happened at the crash site. I know exactly what happened. 
I walked out. I got help. I was shot. Johnny Moat finally admitted that he pulled the trigger because I always said I saw the gun and I heard the shot and I felt a sting in my left shoulder. But he denied it for years because he didn't want to be the guy that shot somebody from Skinner. And he, he lied about it. Um, but I saw the gun. I heard the shot. And then Johnny finally said, well, I think he must have been hit by a, a ricochet. Well, I can say to Johnny and all the conspiracy theorists, you know, I can say, uh, I don't care what they say. I was there. I know what happened. Johnny finally admitted it. I don't care if it was a ricochet or what, whatever he thinks it was. Uh, something went through my left shoulder. And it spun me around, and he picked me up and apologized as he was dragging me into the house. And then we, I made a phone call to my wife, Patricia. It's in the movie. And uh, 30 seconds or less, uh, she was crying. I said, you're going to see it on TV. I got to go. I uh, got in Johnny's pickup truck, and I took him back to the crash site. Now, you've got all these farmers that found the crash site, but I'm the one that led people back to the crash site. And uh, they all of them want to be the hero. Well, I never said I was the hero. I did what any Marine would do. I put one foot in front of the other, and I went out there, and I brought help back to the crash site because my friends were dying. So, you know, I've, I've been in three airplane crashes. I've never been knocked unconscious, and I, I know exactly what happened. Now, there are people like Gene Odom that was on the plane. Gene Odom was fired from the band. When we got to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Gene Odom was going to be sent home because he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't belong on the tour. He was a snitch. He would tell, you know, sell information to Judy Van Zandt and everybody else that he could sell it to, wherever he could make a dime. He's been to all of the Leonard Skinner uh, uh, funerals, and every time he comes with T-shirts for sale, you know, I was at so and so's funeral. Oh I was gosh. at Gary Rossington's funeral. And he's got all these conspiracy theory um backers that believe the bull that he says. And Gene was hit in the head by a, an engine. I mean, bless his heart. Gene, you know, took a hard hit from that plane crash. But he was mad because Gary Rossington didn't give him a big bag of money after the plane crash. And Gary was busy trying to heal up himself. Everybody was trying to do their own healing after that. But Gene is so full of crap. His his books that he writes are complete ridiculous uh, crap. And he's got all these people that follow him. And there's this this wing nut that lives down there on the the property where we crashed. This guy, um, Dwayne Easley. You know, his first statement when he saw the plane crash was, what's a bunch of long-haired, smelly hippies doing with their own airplane? Oh my God. That's how he felt about us. That's how he felt about us. And he was really, really, you know, trying to get a credit for finding the aircraft. He did not find it. He, they may have come up on it. But it was after I had already left the scene and gone to get help and brought returned to the crash site with the help yes they were there and i'm not trying to take anything away from the help that they gave us getting uh people that were still alive and the bodies out of the plane crash but these people are so uh, you know intent on grabbing their glory i only i only spoke about what actually happened and they're trying to grab grab their piece of the glory and gene odom as i said he didn't belong on the tour and he was being sent home, and Gene knows that. But in his books and everything he says and all the crap that he says to people and all of his little uh, his blogs and all these idiot bloggers out there that get on there and, and you know, say all this just complete bullshit, um, all they're trying to do is sell a T-shirt and, and sell the bones of Leonard Skinner in the band. I am a band member. There were seven people that were on that plane that made all the money for everybody else. And, and I'm one of those seven. And now that Gary has, has left this planet, 
it leaves me as the last living member of Leonard Skinner. And they can't stand it. They can't stand it because they've got their own agenda. And their agenda is basically to sell bits and pieces that they stole from the band members out of their basements and their attics and their garages and their, you know, their, their music rooms. They, they stole this stuff back in the days when we were trying to heal up from a plane crash. And now they're selling this stuff, you know, like the bones. They're like vultures. They're like, like, like you know, uh, uh, just this unbelievable group of people. And I'll tell you, it, I, I can't do anything about it. I can't stop them. I can't keep them from saying their lies and their c- complete crap out there. But it is. And, you know, I know what happened. You know, we ran out of fuel at 9,000 feet and spiraled in. And I flew that plane many times. And I, the, the pilot and co- co-pilot made a horrible mistake by not topping off our tanks. Now, Gene Odom has all these conspiracy theories about that the plane was used to go pick up drugs someplace, you know, it's impossible because the plane was parked at an airport that didn't even have a nighttime uh, control tower. And, you know, and they and Gene is saying that when the plane got back from going to pick up drugs, you know, that they used most of the gas. And then we ran out of gas on the way to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's completely absurd, the stuff that Gene Odom said. And, uh, you know, I used to like Gene because he was a friend of Ronnie's. But he, he says all this stuff that he was Ronnie's bodyguard. Take my word for it. Ronnie Van Zant did not need a bodyguard. And now Gene makes a living selling the bones and the blood of Leonard Skinner. He's, he's you know, and uh, I usually don't go off on interviews like this and talk about it. But I've had enough. And all, all of his little guntas that follow his conspiracy theories, to me... Uh, I, I used to maybe listen to them or be reasonable with them, but they can all go to hell because they're full of it, and they just they're trying to make money on the death of my friends. So what I did is I put together an album called Anthems, which is a tribute to Ronnie Van Zant, his music and his band, and the money that the, the lion's share of the money of this album that we're doing, which is an incredible album. Mm-hmm. Um, with Dolly Parton and Sammy Hagar and all these incredible people that sing the the vocals and our own Brad Durden that sings on the hunt on the album. We didn't want to leave our band out. And, And so, you know, the money that is made goes to the children and the grandchildren of my friends that are up in rock and roll heaven. And, and that, that's where the lion's share of the money goes because these, my friends, up in rock and roll heaven wrote these songs and all of the licensing fees and the mechanicals and the royalties have been paid. All the T's have been crossed. All the I's have been dotted. And those, my, the children and grandchildren of my friends are going to benefit from the sale of this album. We didn't do it to make money. We did it as a tribute. Our band, my band, the, the five of us are about the, the, uh, the music not the damn money, which which the rest of these people are just incredibly greedy, you know, uh, lowlifes that are out there doing whatever they can to make a dollar on something that they had nothing to do with, and and were you know put put none of the music together, and yet they're benefiting from it, and yet they try to cause as much problem as they can, and all of them are mad at me because I did something really good that they didn't think of, you know. So, uh, you know, God bless them. You know, I, I don't want them to die or anything like that, but I want them to, you know, I would love for them to shut up, but they're not going to. They're going to continue the, the, the conspiracy theories, you know, all this stuff out there, these conspiracy theories. You know, I, I, can't, I can't believe that the world of America cannot learn to agree to disagree and work across the aisle. But we have been divided. This country is completely divided, you know, right down the middle. The people, you know, that, that love everybody and the people that only love themselves. And I, I love everybody. 
And Ronnie Van Zant was that way too. I don't care if you're black, Mexican. I don't care if you're transgender or gay or lesbian. Ronnie Van Zant, his, his theory was if you're a good person, then you're a good person and it doesn't matter what your background is or where you come from. And that's the way I feel. That's right. And, you know, all these other people, man, it's, it's like, it's us against them. And believe me, this country was built by the African American people and the Mexican people and the Chinese people and, and white people too. I'm white. You know, I'm a Caucasian guy. And, and Ronnie Van Zant was not like that. He was like, if you're a good person, you're a good person. And that's, that's his, his songs say it. The words that he writes says it. And, and that was his mantra, man. And I, you know, I, I appreciate you guys giving me uh, a platform, but I appreciate you guys helping to keep the music of Ronnie Van Zant alive. And, um, Always. you know, we're, we're, we're proud of our, our effort. And believe me, it is not easy. As I told you before, Kiki, it is not easy navigating uh, the ins and outs of trying to put an album together in Nashville, Tennessee, because you've got a bunch of backstabbing lawyers, managers, crooks, wannabes, butt kissers, and brown nosers. But we were able to get it done, and um, and now it can't be taken back. You know, the, the horse is out of the barn. There's 3,000 of our product, our album uh, anthems, that is already out there. The release date is February the 2nd, uh, Groundhog's Day. And we worked hard to get Gary on Freebird with Dolly Parton. We worked hard to work with everybody and get all the T's crossed and the I's dotted to get this album out there. And I've, I've talked to Athens, Greece, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sydney, Australia in the last week, uh, the UK, uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, all over uh, Canada, all over America. And the consensus is, that this is one of the greatest tribute albums ever put together. And, and, uh, and I think it is too. And, and my band, um, APB, we are very proud, uh, to, to, to be able to do this. And we're going to continue to do what we do. And that's get on our tour bus, our 1999 Prevo that we keep clean and, uh, uh, tight ship and it's fast. And we go all over this country and play beautiful theaters that have been restored, killer outdoor venues, festivals, and we take we take Leonard Skinner music to places that the bigger bands won't play because they don't get two hundred thousand dollars. We're not about the damn money. We're we're about the music. So, uh, well, you're coming to uh, a beautiful venue in Rhode Island, Stadium Theater, and it is absolutely gorgeous. You're going to love it. Now, when you come out, Artemis, with APB, will fans be able to buy Anthem at these shows? We don't know because Nashville um, is difficult to work with, and we don't have uh, stock. We don't. We, we weren't sent copies of our album or copies of the CD. We weren't sent any of that stuff. So we're hoping that we'll get some merchandising where we can, you know, sell these and sign them at our shows. Right. We're working on that. Good, because I noticed that it is a very limited release of anthems. So, you know, fans are going to come out to see you guys and they're going to want they're going to want yeah. something, you know, about anthems because it's, it yeah. is, it lo seems to be a great album and I can't wait to listen to it. And what was the, the most fun piece of putting this album together? Like you said, Sammy Hagar, you got Billy Ray Cyrus on there. I mean, it's just Dolly. I, how, how was it not fun? I mean, besides all the technical stuff. Well, when Dolly Parton played Freebird for me to the track that we cut for her, I cried like a baby. Uh, it was very emotional. And that was before we lost Gary Rossington. And that was like six, seven months ago that we lost Gary. Right. Um, you know, as I said before, he was the last founding member of Leonard Skinner, which left after uh, Gary's passing, it left me uh, as the last living member of mm -hmm. Leonard Skinner. Right. And um, it, it doesn't feel good, Kiki. It, it's not something I brag about. As a matter of fact, it feels bad. And, you know, I, I don't wish, you know, I, I don't wish ill for 
any of the people that are out there with their little conspiracy theories, uh, Gene Odom and that whole crowd, you know, I, I, I just wish they would be smarter about their attacks on me because all the stuff they say about me is easy to disprove, you know, uh, but they, they, I'm, I'm an easy target and they take cheap shots. Well, but, you, you, know, you, we, you were there. we did something positive and that, that's what I'm trying to do at 75 years old. I still play drums like I'm 35, mm-hmm. and I, I'm still able to play these songs correctly with a lot of energy and ferocity, and that's what I'm going to do until I can't do it right. And I don't care if that's 85 or 95. I'm going to play these songs as long as I can play them correctly, you know, and uh, that's what we do. And anthems, that why, you know, people say, well, why now? Why record a bunch of Leonard Skinner songs that have already been recorded? Well, the answer is because Ronnie Van Zant deserves it. And his band, Steve and Kathy and, and, uh, you know, Leon and Billy and, and Gary and Alan and, and, uh, everybody, the, the whole band, all the girls, all the guys, they deserve to put a little polish on these songs and then put them out there with the vocalist, like the great Sammy Hagar and, and Ronnie Dunn from Brooks and Dunn and, my God, after Dolly sang Freebird, that opened the door for us to get a lot of other people that wanted to be involved just because Dolly was on there. So we're, we're on Dolly's new album, you know, and Dolly's on our new album. And how could it be any better than that? She's the number one humanitarian in the world. That woman is an angel. Mm-hmm. That woman is a saint. Oh, yeah. and, and what she does for music singer, songwriter, movie star, plays guitar as good as a man, but she is a humanitarian. And when she, you know, put the vocal on Freebird, a beautiful arrangement, it it made me cry, like I said, and that opened up the door for people like Sammy, you know, who came from Ronnie Montrose, the Montrose band, uh, used to open up for Skinner all the time. Well, Sammy was in that band. And then he went on to follow the yellow brick road you know, and, and do all the great th- things that Sammy has done in his career. And, and now, you know, he's on our album and, and put his heart and soul into that, the, the delivery of that vocal. All of the, uh, all of the guest artists, uh, you know, put their hearts and souls into that, uh, into those songs because it, they're singing for Ronnie, a feller, a fellow singer and songwriter. So, um, you know, all I, all I can say is, you know, the reason a, a while ago I got mad at Gene Odom and, and, and this guy, um, Dwayne Easley, that the property where we crashed, because these guys have come out over the years and said horrible things about me, you know, and I've kept my mouth shut for a long time. But when you opened up that can of worms, I just finally, you know, I, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of letting them get away with these right wing conspiracy theories about the plane crash. I was there. Right. I know what happened. And, uh, you know, they, they don't. They were knocked unconscious. And then later on, they, they put together what they think might have happened. Well, I know what happened. In, rea- and, uh, in reality, it, comes, it comes back around to the fact that we have this album, Anthems. Ronnie wrote songs that will be around for the next thousand years or, or two, you know, and, uh, and Anthems is a great, I think one of the greatest tribute albums of all time. We're so proud of it. It wasn't easy to get done with all of the people take, taking shots at us, you know, down in Florida, taking it shot after shot. Of course, they can get on their little computers and say anything they want to. Because they got their blogs and their, you know, and and all their podcasts and all this crap that they get out there, and they can say anything they want to and not be held accountable. Well, I'm telling you, they won't get on a podcast with me because they know that I know better. And uh, you know, I, I'm going to just keep it positive and say, you know, we want everybody to enjoy the performances on anthems. The package looks great. The artwork looks really cool. We got a lot of our thank yous in there and, uh, from the band. And, uh, it, you know, it, under the circumstances, we did the very best we could. 
Absolutely. And like I said, we all can't wait to hear it. But I, I just have to interject and say, reality is you've never had anything to gain by not telling the truth. I mean, it, I, I've watched interviews of you from days after the crash up until currently listened, watched, you know, and you've never been out there with anything to gain. You've only been out there sharing and and telling the story the way it happened. And even throughout the years, I don't see you as someone who is trying to capitalize on anything. You're just out there playing because you love what you do. You love the band you're a part of. And that's what I see you as Artemis. I don't see you as anything else. And that's, I just had to say that because it, it blows my mind. It just, I don't want to get you started again, but it just blows my mind. You had nothing to gain. You have nothing to gain. You were there. It's, it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that you are here to tell us what really happened. How many people can say that? who have been through a, a plane crash like you were in you're incredible well, and and we thank you for everything that was, my, that was i appreciate your words kiki that means a lot to me and you know that was my third airplane crash mm. and um you, you know so thank god um you, you know we we have these incredible artists we were able to go to nashville i get the best drum sound i've ever gotten uh kent wells you know, Dolly's producer got me a big, fat Nashville drum sound. Wow. And what we do as a band, you know, we don't want to, you know, go into courtrooms with a bunch of attorneys that are out to, you know, fleece us. We, all we want to do is get on our tour bus, go to the next gig, our incredible crew. We have the best crew in the business, set up our equipment, play these Leonard Skinner songs the best we know how, and let people enjoy you know, uh, the sincerity of, in, in which we play these songs. And that's what we do. We are a live performance band. And that's what we do. And I, I appreciate your format. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And, and your fans love you. I mean, they absolutely adore you. They love your band. And the comments about you and all of you are always positive. So it, it's it's great. I can't wait to see you. And and one more thing, one more question before we go. What is the one thing, Artemis, from your time in Leonard Skinner that always makes you smile? What a, a memory of of the uh, in the seventies. Yes. Just how much fun we had on the road as, as a band. You know, uh, situations that were. Um, sometimes serious, but most of the time, um, you know, we had a lot of laughs and we shared, um, you know, the stage opening up for the Rolling Stones and all the great bands uh, that were out there um, touring. Uh, just, just uh, you know, we don't mind working to earn our money. Um, we don't mind going out and, and traveling those thousands of miles. Um to, you know, to do what we do. There's not many bands that do what my band presently does. And that, that's, you know, we recently, last year, our agency who, you know, really let us down uh, out of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, our, we're with Blue Raven Agency out of uh, New Jersey now. They believe in us and they stand up for us. But these agencies in, in Nashville were all jaded. And the one parting shot that they did after I asked them to please get us some gigs that we didn't mind working for our money instead of holding out for a, you know, a $25,000 show, I said, we, we don't mind playing $7,000 shows three in a row. We'll, we'll earn our money instead of waiting. And the last parting shot they took at me was to give us a show in Rio Doso, New Mexico with Lori Morgan. And we got on our tour bus and we spent five days on that tour bus to go to Rio Doso, New Mexico and play one show and then turn around and come back five days on that bus, you know, and I, I'm, I'm in my seventies, but I, I'm in good shape. I'm fine. But it's like, that's the kind of stuff that they shoot at us. If they can't dictate to us or use us or abuse us, you know, they'll send us out to do one show like that. And that was a parting shot. And that was the last straw. I, 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 I let that agency off the hook and we went back to New Jersey where they believe in us. 
a friend of ours named Sean, he will stand up. Because, you know, I've had some horrible, you know, there's been some horrible things said about me. And I'm an easy target. And there's been some false accusations made about me. And when Sean from Blue Raven gets a call, somebody saying, hey, we heard Artemis might be a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Sean just simply says, nope, none of that's true. Um, You know, it was all made up by one person that tried to extort money from Leonard Skinner. It's that simple. If you pass on Artemis's band, you're going to be losing because the fans and, you know, the people that come to the shows love the band. Mm -hmm. And so he stands up for us where these guys in Nashville, they they go, oh, uh, we're sorry. We apologize. Well, you know, I don't apologize for any of that stuff because a false charge was made against me and it was a crime worse than murder. And I somehow navigated it and got through. You know, a lot of people thought I was going to end up a drug addict or an alcoholic or I was going to kill somebody. Well, I didn't do any of that Mm -hmm. because that's not me. And I I found out, you know, that I'm not a murderer, even though there was a bunch of people that deserved to be murdered for what they did to me. I'm not that way. I am not a killer. I wouldn't do that. You know, I would just let them, you know, face God when they when their time comes. And I, I, I sleep fine at night. You know, I, I know what I've done. I know what I haven't done. And and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm an easy target, uh, but I've been able, I never hid under a rock after these horrible charges were made against me. I, I faced the whole thing by myself because my band uh, was, you know, ensconced in, in like an uh, unbelievable gluttonous cocaine consumption at the time. And they looked the other way when I was being taken down by the court system, you know, and, and, and threatened. And I, I faced it by myself. I got through it. I survived. It makes me sick the way my family had to suffer, you know, and the millions of dollars that were stolen from me. But, you know, I'd, I'd like my family to have that money. But, but my immediate family stuck with me. I have a great relationship with my children, my daughters, my sons, my granddaughters, my grandsons. We all play music together. There's eight of us. And, uh, you know, we, we, we are, I, I'm happy. I, I, I mean, it may sound like I'm pissed off and everything. I, I'm really, honestly, I'm happy. And um, I love, you know, playing the music. I love my band. But mo- more than anything else, and our band is all about family. If something within our family, within our band comes up, family is always first. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we can always reschedule. But, you know, I, I appreciate so much, Kiki, your letting me um, vent. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, so letting me um, vent. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, course. So see you in Rhode Island. When is that gig? That gig is actually on February 10th. And Artemis, I just want to, you know, once again, because we, we spoke several years ago as well, I just want to say Anthem's Everyone's excited, you know, honoring the music of Leonard Skinner and Ronnie Van Zant, you know, and, and Gary Rosington. We are, and you, of course, as well, and everybody else involved. We are so excited to hear this release from you. And, you know, I, I just have to say once again, thank you for sharing your story with us. You don't have to do this. You really don't. But talking to you is really just iconic and you are a pillar of strength because I don't know if I would be able to have gone on like you have, and, but you did. And so thank you for your strength. Thank you for your music. And just thank you for being you, Artemis. You are a good guy and we all love you. Your fans absolutely adore you. And I can't wait to see you here in Rhode Island in February. And thank you. I, I, I love Rhode Island, Kiki. Uh, and we we can't wait to come up and play. I'll see you in February. It's right around the corner. Um, you know, please come. We'll roll out the red carpet. Hang out with me. As far as I'm concerned, you can sit behind my drum riser and watch me play. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> and, and you'll you'll say to yourself, "Wow, that old man can really play drums." 